Let's talk about Queen Elizabeth and why her death after 70 years on the throne has revived debate about the British Empire. It's my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Her state funeral was on a scale that none of us are likely to ever see again. A very momentous occasion, it really is. I mean, the amount of dignitaries that are there. It wrapped up 10 days of national mourning where about a quarter of a million people lined up for hours to pay their respects. I think it's been nice to say thank you to all that she's done. Having to stand in line in the queue for likely 14 hours, really not that much you know, in comparison to what she did. She was so much a part of our lives that um, there was something solid and stoic and safe knowing she was there. I think the, the depth of feeling and the extent is pretty astonishing. But at the same time, there are other conversations happening too about the role and relevance and responsibilities of the British monarchy and how much the Queen's legacy is tied up with the complicated and often violent history of the British Empire. So for me, it's always been about looking at the monarchy through the eyes of colonialism. I think that her legacy is one that um, will become more and more complicated as, as this moment recedes and the world steps back. People are wearing different lenses, they have different perspectives on the past, on the colonial past. And the Queen becomes this person where all of these sentiments get projected onto her, fairly or unfairly. So what is the connection between the Queen and the Empire? How did the Empire change under Queen Elizabeth? And what could all this mean for her successor, King Charles? Now the thing about Queen Elizabeth is that her reign spanned both the empire and the end of that empire. Queen Elizabeth drives to her coronation. When she ascended the British throne in 1952, she also became monarch of more than 70 territories around the world. Most of these became independent countries during the first 20 years of her reign. But by the time she died, she was still the head of state in 15 countries, known as the Commonwealth Realms, which include the UK, Australia, Canada, and several Caribbean nations. The Queen straddled this boundary, right, between the colonial period and the post-colonial period of decolonization. So that's what makes her so interesting. The British Empire goes back to the late 1500s. Over the next 400 years, it became the biggest empire in history, everything you see here in red. By the 1920s, it covered one quarter of the Earth's land, with territory on every continent, except Antarctica. More than 400 million people lived under that empire. And at the center of it all, there was always the royal family. The British royal family and the British crown is the face of British uh, imperialism. Those of us who study colonial history know that Whatever colonizers did, they would always invoke the king, they would always invoke the crown as justification for what they were doing. And that's why Queen Elizabeth's death brings up these big questions about what happened under the empire, how she was connected to it, and how that history is still playing out today. I think her passing reopened certain uh, conversations that people thought were closed. Uh, it reopened certain resentments. I think it uh, brought back memories of some of the more atrocious and violent things that were done in the name of the British royal family and the British crown. It's not only the use of enslaved labor, then we have the expropriation on a large scale of uh, indigenous populations land and the claiming of their sovereignty, um, which really marks the 19th and 20th century. I don't think it would be right to say, you know, the whole empire was wicked, because I don't think that's actually true. Um, the empire has a very checkered history. Um, it, it's, it's, it would be a caricature to say that it was wholly evil, just as it would be a caricature to say that it was wholly good. There were, there were all sorts of complicated consequences, often unintended. Now the Queen only occupied the throne at the very tail end of the British Empire. And some people argue that that distances her from some of the worst parts of colonial history. 
Plus, there is a big focus on how Queen Elizabeth oversaw the dismantling of the empire. But that period, known as decolonization, was also violent in many places. You know, that dissolution was not this kind of, um, th this benign, peaceful transfer of power. It was 30 years. The first three decades of her reign was marked by recurring, brutal, violent end of empire wars. For example, the British fought brutal military campaigns against pro-independence groups in places like Malaya, now Malaysia, in Cyprus, and also in Kenya. And what happened there is something people have been bringing up a lot. British forces used brutal tactics, including torture and detention camps, to suppress a violent uprising by a pro-independence group known as the Mau Mau. What you find is that this is a story of systematic violence and torture um, on an extraordinary scale. That torture was taking place between uh, October of 1952 and 1960, um, during the first eight years of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. After a landmark court case in 2013, the British government apologized and agreed to pay around $23 million to more than 5,000 Kenyan victims. Apart from compensation, one of the objectives in bringing this case was for these veterans to be acknowledged as heroes who are fighting for justice. So let's be clear, some really awful stuff happened during Queen Elizabeth's reign. And that leads to the question of whether she should be seen as responsible in some way. One thing to keep in mind is that as a constitutional monarch, her role was symbolic. She was not allowed to intervene in political matters. To what extent was she personally responsible? Well, in a sense, not at all. I mean, the queen did not direct government, did not decide what colonial policy was. Um, was she responsible as the head of state. Well, yes, in a sense, she was in that the state itself, which she embodies, was responsible for things that were done under its control. So, you know, the, I'm afraid the, the answer is a bit unsatisfactory. It's, it's yes and no. So then it comes down to what the Queen did do and what the world saw her do. And a big part of that was building bridges with former colonies, attending Independence Day ceremonies and making countless royal visits. Even though these days, people may question the optics of some of those trips. And then there was the Queen's commitment to the Commonwealth, which she was the head of. It's basically an association of former British colonies, although other countries have also joined. She was simultaneously the face of the British Empire and all the brutalities and all the theft and all the terrible things associated with it. Uh, but at the same time, this very nurturing uh, figure that people in many African, former African colonies of Britain could look up to, uh, could even admire, admire, you know, they would see her displaying the grace and, and, and poise and this, this nurturing, caring attitude. She went to Ghana and she was dancing with my, my then president, Kroma, a part of the royal family. You see that duality, you see that complexity uh, playing out as people try to remember her legacy, her long legacy. And now that the Queen's gone, it's down to King Charles to deal with that complexity, which also comes with pressure for some things to change. The debates over the role of the monarchy and the legacy of the British Empire aren't going away. If anything, they're getting louder. Last year, Barbados got rid of the British monarch as its head of state. From this moment, every Barbadian becomes the living embodiment of the new republic. The Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda recently said they plan to hold a referendum on it. Apology, no! no! And there's talk of Jamaica doing the same. I think that there is no heightened consciousness about the role of the monarchy and the need to put an end to that relationship that we've perpetuated for far too long. Colonialism is something that didn't just happen three, four, five hundred years ago. It's something that's still affecting all the countries that they invaded now. The world in which King Charles is uh, imagined as king in is uh, radically different from the world in which Queen Elizabeth was queen. And so I think in that sense, he's going to have a much harder time uh, sustaining that image of the British royal family. 
as the this this institution that unites uh, the formerly colonized and this humanizing, nurturing uh, institution of solidarity. There are also calls for the British government and other institutions to pay reparations as a form of redress for what happened in the past, and for King Charles to apologize, something many people are disappointed the Queen never did. Nobody's going to say, well, you know, she, she, she should have rejected being Queen or she could have abdicated. But having become Queen, I think she reigned uh, the particularly significant moment in human history when she could have used that platform. I think she could have wielded her moral power, she could have uh, deployed her enormous symbolic uh, authority to shift the terms of the conversation. Um, should the king apologize? I think that's something that we can look forward to discussing probably over some years. But I think, you know, that um, uh, it would it would please some people, it would displease other people. That's the thing about all of this. There will never be a consensus. And how you view these issues comes down to how you assess and interpret history. And everyone's going to have different takes on that. But the death of Queen Elizabeth II and the accession of King Charles III brings the debate into a new era. Check out this playlist to watch all our other Start Here episodes. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss our next one.